Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Bible reading. It is Monday, February. Job 22, and finally, my favorite book in the Bible, 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in the book, or the chapter of chapter 9. Let's dive right in and see where we are today. Um, Exodus chapter 5, we are now the, the battle, the biggest battle of the Old Testament of the people of Israel, the underdog formed by God to be his chosen people who are still nothing right now, who are still just a bunch of mixed people. Remember, there is Israelites here. There is people involved from Canaan. There are other slaves involved. So it's not just the people of God who have grown into this. It's a mix. And as you continue to go from then until when the monarchy is formed, it continues to be mixed people. There's even Egyptians who become part of this group. So you must realize that this is a mixed group that God has brought from nothing to something. And not just something, but something of prominence. And this is that big battle. That's why the Old Testament constantly goes back to Egypt. Remember what God did in Egypt. Remember what God did in Egypt. This is that battle. This is so important for us to remember how God moved in Egypt because it helps us remember the power of God, but also how he moves in your life and my life. And so the first showdown is now Moses in front of Pharaoh and he says, look, Pharaoh, let my people go. You've had my people long enough as we hear and read in other parts of the scripture. It's over 400 years they've been in slavery and finally God's acting on it finally after 400 years. We'll go into reasons of why later. Um, but here we find that Moses is standing before him and he shows him the sign. And, um, well, he doesn't show him the sign. It doesn't say that. He just says that he tells him. And um, Pharaoh's just like, wait, who are you? I don't know who you are. I don't know your God. I don't know anything about you. Now notice Moses probably knows who Pharaoh is because they probably knew each other as Moses was growing up. That's probably the only reason why Moses had an audience because it was, oh, this is Moses. Why is he like this? What's going on? And so this conversation is held. Pharaoh gets upset at Moses' request. And in verse 6, it says, The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people, as well as their supervisors, you shall no more give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them gather their own straw, but they must make the same amount of bricks. So the supervisors went and told the lower leaders and then eventually got to all the slaves. They were panicking. They started scavenging like roaches at night when the light turns on. They're going everywhere trying to gather straw and they're panicking and they don't make the quota. And then the men, the leaders come over and tell Moses this. Verse 21, the Lord look upon you and judge you. Ouch. You have brought us into bad odor with the Pharaoh. That's interesting imagery and his officials and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. My God, you want to talk about betrayal. <laughs> and the interesting thing is they both feel it. Let me explain. The people of God feel betrayal because they have it hard enough. Here comes Moses, makes life even more harder. It gives them a bigger reason to hate God, right? Like we already don't believe in God because we've been here 400 years and now you do this. I mean, imagine the stress that these people are encountering. Um, and and you can't just completely rush it off because we know the end from the beginning. We know what happened in the story. We say, hey, chill out, have faith. But at the point, it just seems bad. Who is this guy? He's making more work for us. Now you got to hear Moses. God, what in the world? You brought me here. This is your idea. Why am I getting the pressure? Why am I getting hit? This is something we need to realize as people, church. When God does something, he challenges us all of us. It changes our faith. When we encounter difficulties, remember it's an opportunity for God to grow us. God is in the business of changing lives, not just solving problems. Anyone can solve problems. People can solve problems. God is in the business of changing lives primarily, and He uses problems because that's how people respond. God would rather us not have to go through problems. He'd rather us just change. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So God says, all right, this is how humanity is. This is what you guys want to do. I got to send you problems to change you. God is in the business of changing people. And though it is uncomfortable, we might have to realize as these leaders of Israel that look, we may experience pain, but God's trying to do something good. As people of God, we need to realize that too. When bad things happen, realize God is up to something. Amen. Luke chapter 8. This chapter is long, I tell you. There's so many different stories. So let's start from the beginning. I don't want to skip or miss the beginning because this is important. 
It talks about Jesus and his disciples, and it mentions, his, mentions women. This is important. It says at the end, out of these women, or out of them, out of their resources, it was provided for them. Meaning the disciples and Jesus' ministry, it was provided. These women provided for them. Well, what kind of women were these? Well, first it says, don't forget the woman who'd been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene from her seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Herod Stuart, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others. So there's many other women involved here. And so we already know Herod Stuart, Chusa, might be a woman of wealth, might have something. Um, Susanna, not sure who that is yet, probably somewhere. Anybody, some of you might even know who that is. I'm sorry, I don't. But then notice Mary Magdalene. It says the one who was demon-possessed with seven spirits. But what do we also know about Mary Magdalene? She was a prostitute. So we need to think about this. Wait a second, Jesus. You mean to tell me you are using money that was used by men who used her as a prostitute? You're using that money? Are you crazy? This goes back to the very end of the Gospel uh, of Matthew where you see the Pharisees refusing to accept money from, from Judas. Why did they refuse to accept the money from Judas? Because that money was blood money. It was money that they gave to Judas to betray Jesus. And they refused to use it because it was blood money. So they got it and bought a gravesite instead. But Jesus uses money of a prostitute for ministry. I don't know. I kind of equate them both. You know, Jesus probably would have used that money of, of betrayal. If Jesus was a Pharisee, he would say, fine, we'll take it. We'll use it for, for ministry. And this comes back to the gift of idols. The chapter before, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, where it says some people are too weak to be able to use um, food offered to idols. It would cause them to stumble, it cause them to struggle. And if you are strong in the faith, don't eat food offered to idols in front of them because they are not strong in faith. And so this is a reminder, look, God calls us to use money. Jesus is being very practical. He's like, look, this is money. It helps regardless of where it came from. It could be used for good. Another thing, another scriptural text, God will use good or God will make good come out of evil. God doesn't deal away with the evil and say, well, we can't use it or we can't do it. God's like, no, like, I'm God. I could use anything. I can use anyone. Their backgrounds, no matter what they've done, I can use it. So I think it's powerful. This is an example. And we easily miss over it because it's just a couple of verses. But God used prostitutes. God used women, which most men don't, um, to, to do ministry. And Jesus is no exception. This is a reminder to us, church, that God will use anyone and anything to do his work beautiful beautiful you will skip over that unless you realize who mary magdalene is and that jesus used women to do ministry jesus talks about the parable of the sower right after this so we know what that's about uh the seed is the word of god and then the four different soils um the wayside the thorns the rocky and then the good soil which is 60 80 or 100 fold and jesus explains all of this that hey the word of god goes out everywhere it reaches all people and it ultimately comes down to the soil of their hearts are they going to receive this and are they going to push through and are they going to allow the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit? We don't produce fruit. God produces the fruit. Another reminder that all things come back to God. Then it goes on to talking about hiding your light under a bushel. Your light is beaming because of what God has given you, your talents, your gifts. Don't hide them. Don't bury them. Find a way to shine them in all ways, in all times. Then Jesus gets into a boat and the storm gets crazy and Jesus calms the storm and then he goes to this side to see this man named Legion and no one can stop him no one could talk him out of his craziness uh, modern day people might say he has schizophrenia or multiple person per multiple personalities but here God's just like I don't care what the guy has he's cured amen God's like you could call and give names to whatever you want if I want it done I'm gonna do it and he heals him powerful 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 and people are scared because all the you know demons um go into pigs and they jump off the cliff go into the ocean and there you go so this is another powerful example of who god is um after this ordeal it says jesus now goes uh to a town and jairus we know jairus he's the man whose daughter is dying and he's um and he's a person of very great importance he's of the temple so he comes over and he asks Jesus for help. Jesus starts to walk over and then he's interrupted in the middle of his journey by a woman who is bleeding for 12 years. And she comes and she hides and Jesus wants to make a spectacle of her, not in a bad way, but in a good way to affirm her. Because Jesus, watch this, 
didn't just want to heal her physically, he wanted to heal her emotionally, give her courage, give her strength, because she is a daughter. And Jesus says, daughter, you are healed. Jesus says, you are healed. Your faith has made you well. You are adopted. You are loved. You are cared for. Even if all of society does not care about you, love you, know anything about you, I do because I created you. And that is the message Jesus is sending by pausing to sharing to Jairus and to everyone. This woman is important. Do not overlook her. She's my daughter. Powerful, powerful moments. But not to leave Jairus hanging. Obviously, it says that his daughter dies and Jesus says, hey, she's just sleeping. Everyone laughs and Jesus is crazy. But to Jesus, death is asleep. As we know, death is asleep until the final death, the final death, the second death. That's death to Jesus because that's the death that no one comes back from. And as we know, Jesus did that death for us on the cross. So we would never have to experience that. And so Jesus goes to the house and he heals her, raises her from the dead, and does even a greater miracle than if he would have just healed her of her sickness. So Jesus knows what he's doing. Jesus knows when things are difficult. Jesus knows when things aren't working out, that he's in control and he's going to make it work because he can. He has the keys of life and death. And so Jesus continues to do amazing things in the lives of people. And we must remember that he can do the same in yours and in mine. Let's go to the next one, halfway through Job chapter 22. And this is where Elipaz speaks of Job's wickedness, like, look, Job, you keep defending yourself. We keep telling you this could be the issue, this could be the issue, but Job, you're not listening, so I'm calling you out. Now they're getting aggressive, and you know what? Friends can do that. Friends can call each other out. Friends could be honest with each other, and I don't know about you, but we all need friends who are like that. We need friends to hold us accountable. We need friends to tell us if we're messing up. We need friends to tell us if we're doing well. We need friends to tell us of our blind spots because, I mean, who else is going to tell you, right? It's important to pray. It's important to know what to ask God and how to move, but you need, to help. You need people in your life who can call you out. And so Elipaz, in a weird way, is not doing the helpful thing, but in, in his mind, doing the right thing. He says, can a mortal be of use to God? Verse 2 of 22, can even the wisest be of service to him? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are righteous or it is gain to him if you make your ways blameless? God's like, look, does God benefit from any of this? No, he realizes if you do something wrong, you need to be punished. That's his point. And he goes on to say, is not God high in the heavens? Verse 12, see the highest stars, how lofty they are. Therefore you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deepest darkness, thick clouds and wrap him so that he does not see and he walks on the dome of heaven. He's like, look, God sees through the darkness of the clouds from heaven through all this and he sees us. Don't think your sins can hide you. You are wrong, Job. You are wrong. You're a sinner. You broke something. This only happens to sinful people. No, you need to repent. Repent, 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 and things will be made right. Verse 23, if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tents, it will. if you treat gold like dust and gold of Ophir like the stones of the storm torted band, and if the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Wow, this guy's going like in his face, like Job. I don't care what you're saying, you're wrong. I mean, we need friends to call us out. We need friends to keep us accountable. But man, when your friends are wrong, this hurts. This really hurts. Like your best friends not believing you. And if your best friends don't believe you, that's crushing. It's crushing. But it's nice to have people who hold you accountable. That's the joy. That's the important part of it. And I want to encourage you to have those. If you don't, to find them, to pray for them, because we all need those. And finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is where Paul is defending his apostleship. Remember, his apostleship is more leading to ones who are sent. That's what it means. Apostle means to send, the ones who are sent. And so they are sent. They are anointed. They are chosen by God of the highest caliber. They are ordained to start churches, to grow churches, to teach people, to correct people. Like These are the people who have walked and met Christ in some ways and in ways Paul did because you know he met him on the Damascus Road. So apostleship is the highest spiritual form of leadership of all. And Paul is defending it saying, look, um, I'm called. God used me. God changed me. And I don't do this on human authority. Verse 8, do I say this on human authority? Does, does not the law also say 
the same, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. He's like, look, if I'm serving God, I should be acknowledged for that. He's like, look, people get paid for their jobs, but I am ministering on the behalf of the gospel. I should be paid for the gospel. Look, it says in the same way, verse 14, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He says, look, but I'm not demanding anything of you. I'm a tent maker. I do this on the side because I know this is what God called me to do. I'm passionate about it. You ought to pay me, but I'm not asking you to. You know, Paul is defending not only his apostleship, but defending that he should be paid and not to be arrogant, but to say how powerful the gospel is. This is how powerful it is because I do this for free because I don't want money to be an issue for you to receive it. Paul is going all out to say the importance of his ministry. And then he goes on and says this, verse 19, For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all. See, I'm not getting paid for this, but I am submitting and surrendering myself to each and every one of you so that I may know you, so that I may learn about you, so that I could connect to you, so that I could influence and transform your life through the gospel. What a powerful, powerful and humble, humble approach. And he says these, these painful things that we all, excuse me, he says all these all these things that we need to focus on as Christians, as not apostles, but as disciples, as followers of Christ. He says, look, I am to the weak, I became the weak, so that I might win with the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel so that I might share in its blessing. Paul's like, look, and as pastors, we try to do this. We try to be all things to all people in the church to meet people where they're at to understand all different types of scenarios, but man, that's impossible. Um, and we try and we sometimes we do good, sometimes we fail. But Paul is like, this is my personal goal. I will become weak. I will put myself under the law. I will put myself in Christ. Um, I got to save everyone I can because the gospel is a blessing. And I'll tell you, church, it's not just for pastors and leaders. This is for us as Christians, because as Christians, we are light in the minority of the world. We are charged to be all things to all people as much as possible. We are to strive to grow, to learn, to, to as we're talking about our mantra for reading the scriptures, we are to read, to glean, and to beam. We are to reach all people. And so I encourage you, as Paul is defending his apostleship, that you defend your calling on God to the world, to the devil, and even against yourself claim it. No, this is what God called me to do. I need to strive. I need to grow. I need to beam so people can understand and fall in love with Jesus. Church, I hope you've been blessed by this and may you continue to read, to glean, and beam for Jesus. We'll see you later.